first is freedom of speech and expression everywhere in the world. The second is freedom of every person to worship God in his own way everywhere in the world. The third is freedom from want, which translated into world terms means economic understandings which will secure to every nation a healthy peacetime life for its inhabitants everywhere in the world. The fourth is freedom from fear, which translated into world terms means a worldwide reduction of armaments to such a point and in such a thorough fashion that no nation will be in a position to commit an act of physical aggression against any neighbor anywhere in the world. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. Um, tonight's discussion is about the affordable housing crisis and the role that a national infrastructure bank could hold. My name is Ray Ellen Smith. I am a resident in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'm a retired CPA and worked at PricewaterhouseCoopers for 30 years. Uh, I am also the treasurer for the Democratic Party of New Mexico, and I run the largest indivisible group in New Mexico, Indivisible Albuquerque. Very excited to see you all here tonight. Um, I believe we're going to hear from Alfeca Mutardi first, um, and then we will uh, hear from Senator Robert Hasegawa, and I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that right. Please not apologize in advance. Senator Sanders. Alderman Michael Rodriguez, <clears throat> Representative Catherine Ingram, Senator Bruce Innes, Assemblyman Robert Karabinchak. I'm sure I butchered that as well, I apologize. And uh, I will be your moderator until Julie is able to join. Um, welcome everybody. Uh, Alfeca, I believe you take it away for a few moments. Thank you uh, very much and welcome to everybody. My name is Alfeka Mutardi. I'm a macroeconomist. Um, I worked at the International Monetary Fund and now I'm uh, leading and advising on this infrastructure bank proposal. And um, I'd like to uh, begin just by opening and introducing the, the role that the National Infrastructure Bank will play in addressing uh, the need for affordable housing in our country. And uh, then I'm gonna, I'll come back a little bit later on with some slides on why we need to have this, uh, but we wanna hear from some, some of the other speakers. So to get started, uh, in my view, uh, we have a very serious in, uh, affordable housing situation in the United States, and the National Infrastructure Bank is the only solution that I can see on hand for addressing this issue. Uh, the way that the National Infrastructure Bank will really uh, address affordable housing is uh, several fold. First of all, it will uh, build all of this infrastructure that's on this chart here, including of which will be putting in 700, over $700 billion to build at least 7 million new affordable housing units in the United States. These will be targeted to the households that need them the most, that is the extremely low income households. By providing this many units to those households, we'll be able to lower rents for them and increase the supply of housing overall, which will lower rents for everyone else as well. Another way that the National Infrastructure Bank will help is that it will put more money into people's pockets as they take on jobs to do all of the infrastructure construction in um, all of these different areas all across the country. We'll be creating up to 25 million new great paying jobs. They'll, um, they'll be family sustaining jobs that pay Davis-Bacon wages. We'll be training for these new jobs. So this means that families will be able to better afford to um, purchase or rent or purchase their, their housing. And that will help on the wage side. Finally, the, uh, the, the National Infrastructure Bank will integrate 
affordable housing with other infrastructure improvements, such as public transportation, clean water systems, building schools, healthy, uh, providing health care, uh, all according to uh, urban renewable plans that will be uh, instituted by cities and states all across the country. In integrating projects means that we really build on the benefits of providing housing with all of the rest of the infrastructure improvements. So we can uh, adapt. Uh, we, the NIB has a, a trust fund in it that we can adapt in several ways uh, to, to um, complement the affordable housing thrust. Uh, first of all, we, uh, we'll, we can use this trust fund to provide a subsidy stream of payments uh, that'll support the affordable housing construction and make sure that it is long and sustainable over the, uh, the long term. This has been a, a, an impediment to affordable housing. We want to have uh, things, we can uh, uh, accommodate things like land trusts. Uh, somebody asked a question about this ahead of this meeting to make sure that aff affordability stays in perpetuity. We could okay. partner with community projects and uh, all without new taxes or spending. Uh, so HR is 3339 is passable. Thank you. Thanks, Alfek. I appreciate you uh, speeding through all that important information. I do want to take this opportunity to move right on to Senator Hasegawa from Washington State. He is the chair and of the Democratic Caucus majority, and he sponsored the National Infrastructure Bank resolution in, uh, in Washington that passed the Washington Senate. So, Senator uh, Hasegawa, can you uh, give us your thoughts on how the National Infrastructure Bank can address the affordable housing crisis. Senator Hasegawa, are you muted or can you join us? You would think after a whole session, I would learn. <laughs> so uh, thank you. I just want to tell Rael, and you did a great job on pronouncing my last name. Thank you very much. And I appreciate your starting off with the wonderful oratory of President Roosevelt. Uh, when people ask me who my favorite president is, I usually tell them Eleanor Roosevelt because at least she can incarcerate the Japanese Americans during World War II, but that's a different story. So how the public bank can support uh, public housing, I think that's the key question is public housing. So during the Reagan era and all of that, you know, we, um, where the whole emphasis was by the capitalists was to change the public dialogue from public housing to quote unquote affordable housing. When we did that, we shifted our dependence on private developers to fix our housing problem. But the reality is only the public has the capacity to address our uh, shortage, the imbalance that we have, the gross imbalance, especially in areas like Seattle, Washington, uh, where I'm from. Uh, the supply is so short of the demand that uh, housing is going through the roof. Extreme displacement and gentrification is happening. Uh, people are being pushed further and further from uh, where they work in order to be able to have a roof over their head. Uh, homelessness is just um, unacceptable, totally unacceptable, even for one person to be homeless, but the amount that we have now is unacceptable. So only the public has the capacity to address this. But when you talk about reframing from an affordable housing uh, paradigm to a public housing paradigm, people have this image that's not necessarily positive about what public housing is. So I prefer the term social housing, but that gets down to the ability to finance that capacity to build the hundreds of, of thousands of units that are required to offset this imbalance uh, between supply and demand. So only the National Infrastructure Bank or a state public bank, publicly owned bank can really provide the financing capacity for the public to step up to this moral obligation we have to provide housing for everybody. You know, the International Declaration of Human Rights says housing is a human right, as well as healthcare and many other things. Uh, but 
the only way that we can meet this demand is through a uh, public finance, uh, public, publicly owned bank. Right now, if your state is like ours, we are constantly bouncing off of our debt ceiling, which means um, our infrastructure continues to crumble or not grow with the capacity of requirement that um, we need not just to meet existing demands, but to meet future demands as well. We can't even think about future economic development because we're at our debt capacity to even finance maintenance at this point. So um, I'm hoping that uh, this Senate Joint Memorial that I sponsored this past session got passed by the state Senate but it died on the House floor for some reason and it's internal politics, but the House refused to pass the joint memorial, which you would think is a no brainer kind of a thing to just tell Congress, we need the National Infrastructure Bank. Um, I have higher hopes for the next session, but we all know we can't wait. We need to get this done as soon as possible. So I appreciate all of your interest in this and supporting it and continue to work on building the campaign to get HR 3339 passed by Congress. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hasegawa. We certainly appreciate all your efforts in Washington state. I would like to introduce Representative Catherine Ingram. She is a member of the Ohio House. Uh, she's on the Higher Education Committee uh, where she's the ranking Democrat. And um, so Representative Ingram from, I believe, Cincinnati, Ohio, can you uh, give us some thoughts on how the National Infrastructure Bank might address the need for, I'm gonna clarify that and go with Senator Hasegawa's definition, public housing or social housing. Um, thank you so very much uh, for allowing me to be here. I probably learned more than uh, I, I give any education points on this. But uh, I, I'm going to say this before I get started. Be clear about when you start to say public housing, what that means to people. So let's not get stuck on that yet, um, because public housing is what they tore down in Chicago with Cab Cab Cabrini Green. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, what you see now that we are, in, especially in our inner city core, are trying to slowly but surely uh, wean away from, as HUD said years ago, we're trying to get out of the business of subsidized housing. But anyway, uh, today I just want to talk a little bit about, uh, I have been appointed to what we call here in Ohio, a most recent, it was in our most recent biennial budget bill, to create a uh, federally subsidized housing uh, study commission. And we're doing that, of course, for a couple of different reasons, but we're getting lots of information about um, the need for extremely low income uh, housing. And of course, the more you talk about it, the more you hear about it, the, the in 19 and what was it, 86, when the law was created with LIHTC and all of the, the low income housing tax credits, et cetera. Those are things that, that we are looking at now. But I think part of the argument is, is that with rents set and restricted, then, um, taxes are not being paid. So what I'm hearing and what I'm finding that people are discussing now is who's not paying their fair share of taxes. So when we start talking about low income housing and what that looks like, we also have to talk about a solution for uh, the capitalization of the valuation of some of those properties where those folks are. So uh, my CPAs and all of you other smart math people can figure that out for me. But it, it, it's become a, and I think uh, one of the previous speakers just said, a balancing act because housing stock um, is short for everybody at every income level. Uh, as a realtor, you'll find that there are, uh, you have multiple bids by the end of the day as soon as you put a house on the market. And so um, in looking at that, part of our hope is and how I think the uh, infrastructure bank could help is with those monies and the ability to have the uh, financing is that we can create housing stock that frees up this argument over what's left. Because what I'm finding now, more and more folks are homeless because why should I rent to you and rents are sky high. 
Why should I even rent to you, let alone sell you a house? If indeed I can get three times as much and not have to have subsidized housing or not have to rent it to somebody who's extremely low income. So I think that the use of those public dollars is what's going to be important. And I think that the infrastructure bank would be uh, able to do that. Uh, we've got all kinds of numbers. And I don't have to rattle them off to you because you know them. The median income for folks here in Ohio, uh, there are inequalities, there are disparities as to who is renting. Um, black and brown people, if 30% of their income is, is you, can't, you cap it at that, the question becomes what's left and then what do they have to pay? And now with the, uh, uh, and the pandemic, and I don't want to blame everything on the pandemic, but the fact that uh, prices are going up, inflation is here, uh, you look at what am I spending that my two thirds on if I've got to spend a third on rent, my little two thirds is not going to buy me the same food that it used to buy. So we've got all those other issues I think that we need to deal with. Um, and I, I think that the infrastructure bank would be almost like, uh, and by the way, the National uh, Black uh, Caucus of State Legislators passed a resolution last December to send that to the uh, to Congress to say to them, hey, you've got to do something. We need this bank. Uh, and because it will impact all of us. And same thing here in Ohio with the Ohio Legislative Black Caucus, which I am the second vice president right now, we've said the same thing. We've got a uh, resolution that we have sent. Uh, there has been introduction of the infrastructure, infrastructure bank uh, bill or resolution here in Ohio too, but it hasn't gone very far. So that's part of the that's part of the problem that we may have here also. But I think that what I want to to emphasize is that I think that at some point it may become the us versus them. I want that piece of property you've got because there's not much property left. And so therefore, who should get it? The person who should afford, can afford it. And in many times across our, our country, we do things for other people. We always do. But when it comes down to us or them, and it's you and your family versus somebody else and their family, then you choose yourself. And so uh, the infrastructure bank could help with that. Uh, I, I think it's ever so important that we push as hard as we can to make sure we get that done. So, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for those comments. And uh, certainly it's, it's very important to remember that semantics matter. And so I appreciate you pointing out that in some parts of the country, the terminology public housing might not be so positive. So certainly something important to remember. Okay, then we will move on to our next speaker. And this is uh, Senator Bruce Ennis from the Delaware Senate, where he is chairman of the Agriculture and Veterans Affairs Committees uh, from Smyrna, Delaware. Please welcome Senator Bruce Ennis. Senator Ennis. Uh, thank you, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, well, before I answer that question, um, let me digress a little bit if I may. You know, uh, from the um, founding of the nation um, to the Transcontinental Railroad, the New Deal, and to the war after World War II, national infrastructure banks had played a central role in America's uh, funding system. Uh, what we need to do and what this bank will do, it'll remove from um, this funding system from the politics and separate it from the federal budget and be grounded in restoring and the country to greatness again. Uh, first off, that, that, to answer your question, then I'll get back to one other comment. Uh, in Delaware, I've served in the Senate for 13 years. This will be my 13th year. And I, prior to that, I served 25 years in the State House of Representatives. So I've got a little bit of seniority uh, in the chambers, obviously. But how, how the uh, National Infrastructure Bank will assist uh, this problem is that it will provide low interest loans for funding for infrastructure, affordable housing, as well as numerous other infrastructure that's needed in this country and has been needed for years. And in addition to that, the 25 million living wage jobs that the state had previously 
will give in people more earning power. Do they want to rent? Do they want to purchase a home? Funds that they do not presently have, many of them today. We have a number of people in our state living in manufactured homes, which is supposed to be affordable housing. But of course, it's on lease land, and that creates a problem. Uh, sometimes it's not as affordable as people think. But we spent millions of dollars every year in our bond bill to increase housing for Delawareans. And then those millions of dollars are matched by the federal government, but it's still far too short what's needed. I didn't want to mention also that in, in running this bill in the Senate as a prime sponsor, a Senate resolution, I want to mention that uh, Delaware, as many of you know, was called the first state. When this bill passed the Senate, I reminded my colleagues that in addition to Delaware being the first state, we're the first state again today. And what I meant by that was we passed this bill at 3.59 in the afternoon on January the 27th this year. That was a day that the Coalition for National Infrastructure Bank set a national day to jumpstart this national infrastructure bank issue. We were the first state that day, the 27th, to pass this resolution. So I hope I answered your question. I don't want to be repetitious. Uh, I do feel that it's important, not only for affordable housing, but for many other infrastructure needs that we need in this country. Thank you very much. Thank you, we appreciate your time. Um, you know, we're, we're living in an era right now, it's sort of a perfect storm of this generation, a huge generation of young people that are getting out on their own and are looking for housing. We have um, Airbnb and institutional investors that are taking properties out of the, uh, the rental market and the housing market in general. Um, we have a, a lack of funding for affordable and low income housing. And, and I think this is something that a couple of our speakers have addressed. The minimum wage in this country has not kept up with inflation. And therefore, many people are not able, are simply not able to afford rent or afford a mortgage to move into a house. And then let's combine that with the increased cost of construction and that sort of thing. So we're definitely living in, in challenging times here. And um, one of the, uh, the benefits of the National Infrastructure Bank is our ability to be flexible and creative in helping provide that funding for local projects to address um, the, our critical housing needs. Um, so uh, we are waiting for um, some additional speakers to log in, but I'd like to go back to Alfeca. Did you have a, an additional slide that you wanted to show? Sure, uh, yes. Uh, if you could pull um, my slide deck back up again. Um, I just wanted to give it a little bit of background information since some of the other speakers talked about this too. Give you a quick history of how we got to where we are with, uh, with our lack of affordable housing in the country. Uh, we had a good start uh, during the New Deal uh, when FDR uh, passed, uh, got passed a, an act, a housing act in 1933 uh, that directed uh, the Public Works Administration to build a whole bunch of um, um, to, to build and rehabilitate and clear slums and uh, build uh, affordable housing. One of the things that precipitated this was a really bad fire uh, in the Northeast um, among, among garment workers, which showed the, the plight for uh, the lack of affordable housing. Uh, and this, this was bolstered up then by construction dollars lent by the RFC. Uh, we had uh, money subsidized from the budget. Uh, so that was a good start. But despite that, and despite uh, passing a bill in 1968 to create the Housing and Urban Development uh, Department, uh, nevertheless, public housing did get a very bad name, as some of the speakers have mentioned. Uh, what they went in for was building these large, uh, tall apartment complexes that were kind of enclaved off. Here's a picture of one of them in St. Louis that was built in 1954, and then um, when crimes, crime set in and uh, it became clear that the, the, the housing was not functioning as it was um, you know, con uh, conceived, they demolished the, uh, the, whole, the co whole complex in 1972. 
So we've had quite a few cities give up on public housing, these kinds of projects that are owned by the federal government. Um, big cities like Chicago, New Orleans, Atlanta uh, actually eliminated them. Ma the main city that still has public housing is New York City. Uh, but altogether, we only have, we had a lot of units destroyed and only about 1.1 million units remain. Uh, then we, the government turned its, its uh, sights on a different concept as, as Senator Hasegawa mentioned, uh, the 74 Housing Act wanted to encourage the private sector cons to construct affordable homes, it gave them cons construction tax credits, um, provided uh, communities with block grants to, re to re redo re refurbishments, and also provided money uh, through the HUD budget for rental assistance to make the difference between what the market rates were and uh, the rent needed for these pe for uh, people in low income brackets. However, the truth of the matter is this policy has not worked. We've talked to bankers, for example, who say uh, developers simply will not build units for extremely low income people. That's where the big problem lies. This is a market failure and no amount of tax incentives is working right now. So uh, we've had, um, um, you know, uh, the, the, and then on top of that, the HUD budget has been cut almost in half from the Clinton years to the present. Uh, and this and they also put a uh, Bill Clinton also put a an amendment to limit the number of housing units that could be built. So uh, in response to all this, we now have a crisis. And some of our um, more uh, junior congresspersons like Ilhan Omar have put in a, a bill recently, she reintroduced it this March uh, to uh, focus uh, 800 billion, to call for 800 billion in mandatory spending to build 8 million new housing units, plus another $200 billion for the existing housing trust fund, which is way under um, way, way underpopulated. But the, the point of it is, is this is again asking for a renewed public housing project thrust through the federal budget. And the problem with this uh, approach is it's just not going to work. We are now 300, we are now $30 trillion in debt, uh, which is increasing every day. And we don't have the budget means to add on more debt, another trillion dollars for affordable housing. Uh, it, it's a great idea. It's time has come. We need the, it uh, identifies that we need the housing, but the budget is not the way to do it. So the next slide, let's go, sh let's, let's see where we are today uh, on our housing problem. The most extreme problem exists for the very low income workers. Uh, that is people who, who families whose average income is 30% below the average median income for the area. And you can see here's a map of the National Low Income Housing Coalition folks saying where the big problems are all in the Southwest, all along the California Pacific coast, down to Texas and into Florida, but no, no state in the United States has enough affordable housing for the very lowest income persons. And so what we want to do is not only provide money from the National Infrastructure Bank to create enough units, but we want to target them and make sure that they reach these lowest income earners. Uh, that's where the housing shortage is. Uh, more than 7 million affordable housing units are needed for 8 million, for, for 10 million families. Uh, we have a homelessness problem, not enough shelters, housing poverty, uh, underfunded programs, one in four extremely low income families need assistance and are not receiving it now. So that just shows you where we are. Uh, COVID has made everything worse. Speakers have talked about the fact that inflation is now up at nearly 8% uh, over a 12 month change. Wages are not keeping up. Rents have increased 18% over the past year, some 30% in some cities. If the poverty situation and the housing situation has reached alarming levels. And the only way to fix this is with the National Infrastructure Bank to build more units, to create 25 million new great paying jobs, to put money into people's pockets, to build all of the infrastructure with a sound uh, holistic plan for uh, housing and all of the rest of the accoutrements that are needed to improve our societies. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Alfeca. I really appreciate getting the, those facts. Uh, now I'd like to go to Representative, or I'm sorry, Alderman Michael Rodriguez uh, from Chicago. Uh, the, he's with the, um, the City Council Committee on Housing from Chicago, Illinois. Uh, Alderman Michael Rod Rodriguez. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And I'm going to put my um, 
video on shortly here. But uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, you know, I was the chief uh, sponsor in the city of Chicago for re resolution supporting um, the National Infrastructure Bank. Um, we got uh, unanimous support. Um, I'm the vice chair of the transportation committee here in the city of Chicago. And, you know, we got our work cut out for us here in, in Chicago, the nation's third largest city. Um, but that is a majority minority, 30% uh, uh, Latino, 29% Black. And um, we've done some innovative work here in the city. Um, we have a, we just passed an accessory dwelling unit ordinance um, and that certain parts of the city have opted into, including my district. Um, we've had some innovative uh, demolition fee, impact fees, um, decon anti-deconversion ordinances in our city um, that have supported affordable housing. Um, we have a major issue with in individuals experiencing homelessness and that rise in this population since the pandemic's been um, in our midst. However, we know that we do not have what we need locally. Uh, and as large a city as Chicago is, as much tax generation that we, that we um, create in our city uh, and our state, we know that going it alone is enough. We need federal action. Uh, we need federal investments. And really the only way we are gonna get the affordable housing and infrastructure repairs and upkeep and the good paying jobs that are union wage, living wage uh, is with federal assistance, federal support and federal efforts. So I thank you all for having me today. It's a, quite a pleasure to be here. Um, you've got an ally and friend in Chicago, uh, in, uh, in myself, and in the Chicago City Council to push our local legislators, as well as others, to do the right thing. And that's to invest in the National Infrastructure Bank. So thanks for having me and I look forward to hearing from others. Thank you, we appreciate your, your time. Can I just ask you, was there a lot of pushback on passing the accessory dwelling unit uh, ordinance there in Chicago or what, what did it take to get that through in your community? Yes, there was significant pushback <laughs> particularly from, uh, from some sectors uh, uh, of, our, of our city. Um, we call them NIMBYs, not in my backyard folks, who don't believe uh, in affordable housing. Mm -hmm. But we know that um, we have to push it forward. And, you know, the accessory dwelling unit ordinance is a good thing for all people. It raises uh, all boats. All, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rising tide. Um, we have five areas in the city of Chicago that are pilot areas, and I got my district into that pilot area. Um, and we've seen in a number of communities in Chicago uh, over the last year, we've seen over 350, if I remember correctly, applicants uh, for accessory dwelling units. And, you know, uh, you know the biggest uh, proponent was the AARP, um, the, because mm -hmm. this is an effort also to support our seniors staying at home. Um, so it's, it's accessory dwelling units are happening all over the country. I encourage your jurisdictions, uh, jurisdictions to look at them. I'm happy to share from a Chicago perspective on how we got it passed, but we got it passed due to it being a pilot. And hopefully we're gonna take it to the whole city after this pilot phase. Thank you for sharing that. That's very interesting. Uh, okay, next I'd like to go to uh, Representative Eddie Day Pashinsky. Uh, he is in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives and has uh, been a frequent visitor on our uh, National Infrastructure Bank calls. Representative Pashinsky, would you like to um, uh, help us out with uh, some thoughts on providing affordable housing? Absolutely. Thank you, Julie. And uh, it's so wonderful to see so many new faces on here. The word is getting out and I want to encourage everyone to continue to uh, share that. And I also want to uh, enhance the concept that uh, one of our other speakers had said, and that is because we don't have to go into the politics of trying to get these things passed, the NIB is really the only sure way uh, to get these programs uh, certainly done. 
Uh, Philadelphia is no different than some of our other larger cities where there's always a need for extra housing. Uh, in fact, in my third class city, Wilkes-Barre and uh, Scranton, we're in need of housing due to the fact that we have you know, a lot of folks that are migrating to the area. We have a lot of distribution centers and these distribution centers are doing an awful lot of hiring of literally thousands of folks. So uh, we're trying to now figure out how we're going to help uh, those that are homeless. Uh, we've been working with our churches, like I'm sure everybody else has, and working with a lot of our civic organizations. But the fact of the matter is we don't have enough affordable housing. So I think we're just, um, you know, a microcosm of the rest of the United States in most instances where we need this. And the reality is I don't think we're going to get it unless we have uh, federal dollars, and those federal dollars will come from the NIB. If we're going to wait for our politics, it takes a long time. To those legislators that are on there today that did get your state to pass it, like Delaware, uh, all the good work in Chicago and throughout the, the country, congratulations. Uh, Pennsylvania, we haven't been able to get that bipartisan support. That's not going to stop us. We're going to continue on. But um, every day that goes by, the NIB is the only answer to get all the things we need, even besides the housing, you know, that we need the, the broadband. We know that we need the bridges and the roads and, and the extra uh, train tracks and the rail, all that stuff. So uh, I'm, I'm on board with everyone that's um, spoken today. A lot of folks, uh, again, I welcome you. I've been behind this, uh, all the efforts of Alfeca, Stu, and, and Angela, and their whole group. They've been working on this tireless thing now for uh, quite some time. So it's an honor to be with you all. I say stay strong, and we're going to get this NIB definitely passed. We're going to work on those, those uh, federal congressmen and senators. Thank you, Julie. Thank, thank you, Representative. Uh, next, I'd like to go to Florida. We have a couple people on the line from Florida, and I understand that uh, there's a housing crisis there as well. Uh, Representative uh, Diane Hart from uh, Tampa, Florida. I understand that a thousand people a month are becoming homeless there. That, that's uh, kind of the number you're working with. Can yes. you? Uh... Absolutely. It is. Thank you all so much for allowing me to jump on for a moment. I had an emergency and I couldn't get right on at eight o'clock. But what I want to tell you all is that I did have a meeting this week, in fact, on Tuesday morning with the Department of Economic uh, Opportunity, who was not aware of our National Infrastructure Bank. So I am going and I did talk to, um, I always forget his name, but I am going to set up a meeting so that they can meet with you. They're, right now, what they've agreed to do is a major home owners assistance program for the brief moment uh, at, to the tune of about $700 million that's going to pay mortgages, insurance, and taxes for people who are about to lose their houses. But we do, we're having thousands of people going homeless every day. So what I'm going to do is set up that meeting for the next week or two so that you can talk directly to our state officials in the, in the division of economic opportunity so that they will know about the National Infrastructure Bank. When I spoke to them, they were like, well, no, we don't really know anything about it. But I want you all to know that here in Florida, we're going to be working tirelessly to ensure that all of our legislators are aware of it, our senators are aware, and our Congress people. I've not talked to Congresswoman Kathy Castor as of yet. We've been missing each other, but I will have that conversation very soon. I know that we need this National Infrastructure Bank. And I'm thanking you all in advance for what I know you're going to be able to help us to do here in the city of Tampa and in the state of Florida. So I'm pretty excited about what you all are doing right now. But I tell you, it's hard here. Our rents have gone up about 35 to 40 percent. That is not sustainable. And we cannot get our governor to declare a state of emergency. So I need you all desperately in Florida. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Diane. Appreciate that. I understand it's equally bad in the Orlando area. And I think the number I was given was, um, oh, that rents are rising 25 to 65% in Orlando. 
Yeah. So, uh, you know, just another uh, really tough situation there for the, the folks who, who live there and, and also for people moving to Florida and think that they're going to find, you know, a, uh, a wonderful life down there. Uh, but without housing, it's pretty tough. Um, next, I would like to go to, um, let's see, Ray Ellen Smith. Um, she's already introduced herself, but um, the treasurer of the New Mexico Democratic Party and uh, the party in New Mexico has endorsed the National Infrastructure Bank. We actually have a really strong group in New Mexico, including Senator Tallman, who's been uh, working very hard to uh, get the resolution through uh, the legislature there in New Mexico. But Ray Allen, could you uh, maybe give us an update on, um, on uh, how the NIB might be useful in providing housing in New Mexico? Well, sure. Um, I was very lucky yesterday to uh, be invited to a call um, with the National Low Income Housing Coalition and uh, some very interesting statistics crossed, uh, crossed the slide screen that you know, yesterday, one of which was that the, um, to have an, the hourly wage that is needed here in New Mexico to affordably rent a modest two bedroom apartment is $16.34 an hour. When you look at the statistics of our, um, our actual average wage across the state of New, New Mexico, it's $12.94. So our average folks can't afford to rent a modest two bedroom apartment. So where does that $3.40 shortfall come from? Well, that, th that's where I think the beauty of the entire National Infrastructure Bank concept comes into play. Because when we're able to lift people up with Davis-Bacon wages and good wages because of the fantastic infrastructure projects they'll be able to work on, we're also enabling them to bring themselves up to that, um, to that dollar amount that they need per hour to uh, have, have a great housing. So it's a, it, the whole thing, the twofer for me, it's, it's uh, increased wages as, um, uh, as well as being able to provide um, in low in housing to those who need it the most. So that, that's kind of what I, what I'm thinking about. Thank, thank you, Ray Ellen. Uh, we're going to go back to another speaker from the, uh, the East coast, but first of all, I would like to point out that Congressman Evans from Pennsylvania has signed on to be a sponsor for HR 3339. And in many ways, that's thanks to the efforts of Eddie Day Pashinsky. So certainly we have a very strong group in Pennsylvania that's uh, working hard to raise the awareness and visibility of the National Infrastructure Bank. Um, now I'd like to call on um, uh, representative, or I'm sorry, Assemblyman uh, Kara Binchek, who is on our call, and he's been very instrumental in uh, moving the National Infrastructure Bank uh, resolution forward in his home state of New Jersey. So, um, Assemblyman Kara Binchek. Yeah, thank you so much, Julie, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight uh, to everyone. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm extremely proud to be part of this, this team. Uh, for the NIB um, in New Jersey, we in the Assembly, we just passed the AR-25, um, which is going to uh, obviously be sent to Washington, supporting HR 3339. As I spoke earlier to a bunch of other uh, people that are interested here, we are going to be speaking and have started speaking with our Congress, our Senators, our Governor, to jump on board here and sign on to HR 3339. Um, we see it as a extremely positive way to fund projects than the old way of doing it through capitalization. Um, this is something that is a model that is, is proven to be uh, successful. Um, I think we all have to look outside the box to have this happen, the, the trillions of dollars that could be generated here all across our great nation will help every single state in their infrastructure needs. And it's diverse with everybody who's on this call today with, with the different states that are involved and more and more people getting in, involved. Um, 
I believe that if this does happen, the the work that is going to be produced uh, through the NIB will go on for 10 to 15 years of solid work in all of our states. That is something that I don't think any one of us could have ever said before. I know I could have never said it. The downturn in the economy, this generates the economy, putting people to work. Our professionals who are designing it are going to have an amount of work in front of them. And then obviously the workers that are going to uh, actually build us, the skilled workers, the union workers, depending on your state. And then after that, there's still the maintenance part of it that goes on for perpetuity that we see. Um, all of these, in my opinion, are strong points that everyone should be promoting to their senators, their congressmen, working for any one of these projects in any, in any one of our states or multiple is almost a career for someone. It, it's just unbelievable. And I'm so excited that this is, is, is being energized and there's more and more going on and more and more people are talking about it. That's the groundswell that I'm starting to hear, which is so important. Um, and obviously there's a lot of other things with, with the, with the NIB, with, with the supporting growth of, of what we're looking for, for renewable energy and clean energy across the nation, this could be a funding source for that anywhere in our nation. Thank um, you for your, thank and you again, for, uh, okay. Go thank ahead, you for your comments. comments. Uh, we've got some other people that want to speak and then we're going to open it up for question for Q and A questions and answers. And uh, I'm going to go to Mary Alford, who is on the phone with us. She's a county commissioner in Florida, very familiar with uh, the housing issues there. And in the meantime, uh, perhaps we can get the slide uh, put up of our contact information at the National Infrastructure uh, Bank Coalition. So, Mary, are you on the phone? No, I'm on Zoom. Oh, you're the oh, there you are. Hi. Yeah. Um, All right. That's that's fine. Show your uh, slide. That's great. Um, uh, I'm here in Alachua County. I'm a county commissioner, and we have been, um, Gainesville is in Alachua County. It's a college town. And since the start of the pandemic, we have seen um, renting rent prices double. Um, one week or multiple weeks, we've had as many as 100 people displaced because the rents are so high that we are having our um, landlords decide that um, they don't want to do affordable housing anymore. They would rather upgrade their apartments and rent them to students for, you know, two or three times the amount of money. So, um, you know, a hundred people losing their homes in a week is a huge amount and it's, it's real desperate here. And I heard when I first got on, I heard somebody um, uh, chiding our governor for not uh, calling this a state of emergency, and it truly, truly is. Um, the cost for our county to maintain a family um, that doesn't have a home is so much higher than it is for us to try to keep them in their home. But if landlords are um, not renewing leases and are uh, raising rents, then it's becoming almost impossible. We've got people that we've put up in hotels and uh, we actually bought a hotel to put people up in. It's, it's really a crisis here. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Yeah, your, your experience is similar um, to people all around the country as, oh, as absolutely. everyone can tell from this call. Uh, we're gonna go to South Carolina right now where we have um, Representative Pat Hennigan. Pat, are you on the line? So sorry that I had to get on late, but I was at another meeting. So I apologize to you all. I just heard what Mary Alford had to say, and I'm going to tell you, we're facing the same type of problems that, that uh, she's having in her area. We have people that we're having to put up in, in the hotels. We have individuals that absolutely have no place and they're just displaced. And it's a major uh, problem. We have uh, introduced some legislation in the, in the House to try to deal with this, but also we invited you all to come down to Marburg, up to uh, 
Columbia, uh, and I'm not sure if they set it up yet with the person, my executive uh, director, to see about coming to uh, South Carolina to sit down and, and have some dialogue about this. But it, it's really pathetic when we think about people care more for money than they do human beings and taking care of the needs of the people who have been in those their places for some time. So that is a problem. It's really, you know, and I, I look, we're looking now at the uh, possibility of those small homes, you know, uh, for people. But um, of course we, you know, we have to get the money for it. So we're working on that too. Hey, thank you, um, Representative Hennigan, appreciate that. So with that, I'm gonna open up for questions and answers. We have a lot of um, uh, experts here, a lot of expertise. And so I'd like to open it up. If anyone has a question, please raise your hand. And I see Dennis Montoya also from uh, New Mexico has his hand up. Dennis, do uh, you have a comment or a question? Well, I have a question um, because I would like to hear the answer from someone with expertise, perhaps Alfeca. And it is someone wrote in the chat, we must assure that the NIB is adequately funded uh, or it will fail. And I suspect that the answer has to do with the fact that the NIB, as it is designed, is self-funding. But I would kind of like to hear Alfeca feel that. Um, that comment or that question. Dennis, you are correct. Um, the difference between the National Infrastructure Bank and the federal budget is that the National Infrastructure Bank is a bank that can actually create its own money. It is self-sustaining. Uh, it doesn't need anything from the federal budget. All it needs is the act to create the National Infrastructure Bank and then set a target for the limit of how much altogether it can spend. So we made that target big enough at $5 trillion to cover all of the housing, the affordable housing needs and the other infrastructure projects uh, that the American Society of Civil Engineers say is the cost that we need to repair things. So by making it big enough, it creates its own money. It doesn't need a federal um, um, infusion from the budget. The beauty of it is, is that it can, it's, this legislation is actually passable. It's been done four times before in our nation's past. It's the successful model for fin financing infrastructure when you cannot uh, finance it through the federal budget. And that goes for affordable housing as well. Thanks. Thanks, Alfeca. Uh, next, Thank I'd you. like to go, go with Roger Meadows. He's got his hand raised. Roger, can you tell us what state you're from? And then uh, do you have a question or a comment for us? Yes, um, I'm from uh, New York State. Okay. And uh, my question is, so this is the second one. Um, this is the second one I've been to. And I was just wondering, um, how come the, uh, um, is, there a, is there a Senate bill version of, of HR 3339? Not, uh, not yet, but we are hitting up senators on a regular basis to uh, introduce it. Okay. Also, how, this is the second one I've been to. How come the sponsor of the bill is never on here, Danny Davis? Well, he, I, th I think he's been on at least yes. one of our calls, or we, and he's got a video that we've shown. So he has been on, on the calls, but I'm sure he's out um, proselytizing and trying to get some more sponsors. And, you know, as I think I mentioned, we're up to five. And so every additional sponsor we can get signed on is uh, just a really, um, you know, great to uh, help our momentum in moving forward. But um, we can tell him that we've had a request for more appearances from Danny Davis. Okay, good. Maybe we could get uh, our Senate Majority Leader on board, Chuck, Chuck Schumer. Just uh, that. <laughs> yes, that would be great. I think we've, um, I think we've had conversations with his staff, or we've been trying to get in with his staff. So. You know, uh, we have hit lists essentially of, of every member of Congress. So, but we have what, 435? So, um, uh, members of the House and 100 senators. So, you know, that's a lot of people uh, for us to hit up on our own. And that's where we just asking oh, for support from members of the public to help us um, okay. make those inroads. We could also probably get Kirsten Gillibrand because she has a, a postal banking uh, co sponsor with Bernie. So, she might be more malleable to it. Well, so. give, her, give her a call. Give her a call, okay. Roger. Help us out. Okay, cool. <laughs> we also got other people on here from New York. They could. Uh, hmm? <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> 
That's okay. it. Well, we all, we all need to work together to uh, move this forward. Okay, I'd like to go with uh, Joe Sackman. Joe, what state are you from? And do you have a question or comment for us? I am also from New York. Um, and I've done some advocacy for public banking here with Roger. Um, okay. And so a question, question I have since uh, Alfeca mm -hmm. right, uh, said that um, the bank would uh, be able to print its own money. Um, and so I, that brings other questions. I'm not going to go down that road right now. Um, but would it be able, would it be specifically able to loan out to community banks, credit unions, and if the state did have a public bank to the state and what kind of, uh, return would you be looking for? And, um, would it be, uh, I guess you, you, you yourself would be guaranteed as, as the NIB would be guaranteed. So like if something happened, um, you know, it just didn't go belly up and that would be it. And uh, so I guess I guess I would just to understand that, like, you know, how would the mechanism be for lending the money out to the states or a community bank or et cetera? I, I, and I have a concern about lending money to uh, like Chase or, you know, some some big, huge corporate bank. Uh, is this because this is supposed to be sounds like for a public good? and not for, for profit. So uh, if we can help with that, that'd be great. Sure, I could take those questions. So we envisage that the primary borrowers from the NIB would, anybody, would be anybody that owns public infrastructure. It could be a state or a county or a city that owns a road or a bridge or a utility, um, because these are the areas of infrastructure that need the improvements for which we've slotted the money. But that's not to say that we can't work with uh, a state bank or a community bank uh, on different kinds of projects. Uh, for example, we envisage that um, even a state bank might be uh, a front, a window front for the NIB because they're on the ground. They know the, the customers, they know the state governments, and they can maybe even be loan officers for a fee for the projects that go up the, up the line and that the National Infrastructure Bank eventually um, um, you know, finances. Um, but the, those would be the, the main, uh, um, the, the main <clears throat> borrowing clients from the NIB. <clears throat> now, as to uh, how public banks can finance themselves, we have a little bit of a different model. Instead of taking in deposits um, as a, a state public bank might do, um, and getting um, infusions to, uh, uh, you know, um, capitalization from a state budget to start a bank, uh, we instead go to the private sector using the model of the first bank of the United States, where Alexander Hamilton used um, treasuries that are held by the private sector to capitalize. So that's, that's why we're not necessarily needing any money from the federal budget to get our bank started. But we think that the, these banks can work in symbiosis with state public banks, this bank will be larger and be able to take on <clears throat> longer projects, you know, like big, complicated transportation projects that go across state lines and those other kind of things. Whereas a smaller public bank can take on the spin-off projects that come out of all of this new infrastructure investment and spending. Thank you, Alfeca, for that explanation. Appreciate it. Um, uh, next, I'd like to go to the other side of the country, the Pacific Northwest with Linda Tosti Lane. Linda, did you have a question or comment for any of our speakers? Uh, yes, uh, during the uh, early part of this presentation, there was a discussion about how public housing has gotten a bad name. And I can see where it, where it would continue to have a bad name in the minds of many of the people in our country because of the way the housing uh, market and the previous uh, facilities were built and were not actually uh, met the needs of the communities. So my question is how would the infrastructure bank actually be able to help this specifically to avoid the problems that we've had with the uh, those huge high rises which increased the crime which is what people are associating with public housing. Alfeca, do you want to address that or do we have- Sure, um, uh, I think we can take on, uh, this is just a matter of policy and how we build them. Uh, I think we can take on things like the uh, the Danish model 
uh, the um, Australian model, uh, where we uh, have more um, um, local ownership and um, involvement in running projects and deciding how they're placed in dispersing projects, uh, in uh, combining housing projects with things like uh, higher density and transportation hubs that have uh, low income housing around them with other mixed use. There's lots of different models that um, have come along and we only need to make sure that we have a niche uh, in them, in these models for community development, refurbishment, that uh, make sure we target these very low income housing needs and make sure we're, that we're getting enough units and sustaining them with uh, su subsidi subsidization over the long term to make sure that they stay 50 years viable, in other words, um, to make sure that they're, they have good long, long term subsidy funding along with the capitalization um, financing that the bank would provide. Thanks, Alpeca. Let's go with Nancy Beers in New Mexico. Do you have experience in uh, building uh, uh, affordable housing there in New Mexico or what, what light can you shed on this for us? The experience I have is um, strictly in a community land trust in that, you know, I created Albuquerque's second community land trust um, and, you know, been working to get that off the ground uh, following our our model that we have here with our first community land trust. So, um, but it's very difficult and it's, it's very difficult to do it from a community perspective um, because not many people want to give you money <laughs> in order to build and, and stuff. And uh, especially when you're trying for your first or second property uh, to build it, it's, it's, it's tough. I think it's going to take some creative thinking. And once we have yes. a source of financing available, I think our local communities are going to have to get together and determine how we can have uh, mixed use type developments that are not, you know, so to speak, a ghetto or a slum. And, um, what? you know, affordable housing doesn't necessarily have to be uh, poor quality, I don't believe. So um, I think there's lots of uh, opportunities for the creative minds across our country to work on this project and be able to provide a, a decent place to live for, for many of our citizens. Anyway, Mary Alford had a follow-up question, Mary. It actually wasn't a question. I was just going to comment. Um, here locally in my area, we've just instituted a program where we are going into rental units and spending anywhere from um, five to $15,000 per unit um, and uh, basically gifting that to the landlord. And in exchange, and, and that the purpose of that money is to make um, affordable housing units more energy efficient. Because here in Florida, one of the big uh, barriers to affordable housing isn't just the cost of rent, it's the cost of the utilities also. The utility bills can sometimes be equal to the rent. So, um, so we're doing that. And in exchange, that landlord has to um, uh, uh, contract to maintain that as affordable housing for up to 15 years, depending on how, or sorry, up to nine years, depending on how much money we, we give them in that grant. And then we are calculating the energy saved from those investments and using it to offset our carbon footprint. Uh, so that's one thing that we're doing here in Alachua County. And uh, back to the live work units, um, those are, or, or sorry, back to the mixed use developments. Those are some of our most expensive and nicest um, neighborhoods here and uh, where we are. So um, our, our big push here is to um, where we have affordable housing needs, where there's major thoroughfares, is to um, find a way to finance live work units. So where people, you know, live above the store or live above their insurance office or live above their hairdressing studio or whatever, because that is a way to generate economic development and also put someone in a house. I just want to make those comments. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, uh, any other questions from anybody or comments? Senator Ennis, can you tell us you're in a small state in Delaware. Uh, do you have issues with people moving in from more rural areas into, into the urban areas? And is that causing issues there? Yeah, we've, we've had uh, a number of people moving into our state, uh, uh, mostly from New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, uh, mainly because of property tax, from what I hear. 
but yeah, we have, I uh, have, I represent a large rural area and, uh, and housing uh, is, is an issue in, in the rural areas as well, you know, uh, is in the urban areas. But yes, that's, a, that's definitely an issue. And uh, but most of the people who are moving in are, are uh, moving into the southern part of the state near the beaches, you know, for retirement. Yeah. Whether Elber's taxes are pretty low and we have no sales tax. Hmm, thank you. Um, next, I'd like to go with Robert Chase. Uh, Robert, what state are you from? And do you have a question or comment for us? Um, I'm from Washington State. And uh, we have, of course, a problem here, especially in Seattle and Spokane uh, with affordable housing. But is it, um, is one of the, what, what is causing this? Is it because, uh, you know, we used to have when I was a kid, maybe four people per house. And now we have probably between one and two people per house. So there's a lot more houses uh, out there. And um, it, it's really hard. A lot of younger people want to start a home, but they can't afford it on the wages they make. Uh, so, and also I, I've heard that um, having uh, comprehensive plans uh, causes less housing availability. And uh, a lot of, there, there's a correlation between uh, urban growth plans and, um, uh, you know, comprehensive plans, growth management plans, and the unaffordability of states that have those plans have more uh, unaffordable housing than other ones. Is anybody attuned to that? Would anyone like to address Robert's uh, comments? Um, I know that the, the lack of affordable housing is a very complex issue. So I don't think that you can really pin it on any one thing. It's, it's a combination of factors. I do wanna say that um, in Washington state and specifically in the Seattle area, I think a really great example of how development can help with housing is if you uh, take the light rail out of SeaTac and take it either north or south, and at every single train stop along that route, there's new development, new apartments going in, uh, new uh, refurbishment of older homes, apartment buildings, uh, homes being put up above retail and that sort of thing. So I think that's a really good example of how uh, investments in infrastructure, transportation, and light rail can bring private development um, to a lot of these uh, more rural areas. Uh, so there are some, some, you know, things in Seattle, some um, policies that have been enacted that are uh, really helping address that. But, um, uh, but in Washington State, yes, we definitely have a problem. Uh, Ray Ellen, uh, you've got your hand up. Uh, what can you uh, uh, tell us on this topic? Um, so I, I just wanted to follow up on a question Joe Sackman asked and about um, the National Infrastructure Bank being for-profit, not-for-profit, uh, along those lines. And I just want to clarify my thinking with Alfeca. Um, since the National Inf Infrastructure Bank won't be owned by shareholders, but in fact be owned by the federal government, therefore the people, there is no profit motive in um, the administration of the bank. It is about making sure that th those monies that are um, earned from uh, the generation of loans, the interest rates and all of that are paid back to investors and then reinvested into um, more loans for the bank. Alfeca, do I have that right? Um, pretty much. It's the, actually, the National Infrastructure Bank is incorporated under the U.S. Government Corporations Act. So it's called a government-owned corporation, although it is really a mixed ownership because it is capitalized from the private sector. However, it is still very much a public bank. Uh, it's configured in such a way that those private investors don't have a voting say-so. And other than getting a guaranteed uh, dividend on their preferred stock, they don't have any say-so in the operation of the bank. Uh, and so the bank's operations go along the lines of what it is chartered uh, to do. And uh, any money that is left over after meeting other all the operational expenses of the bank, um, if there's anything that would be equivalent to a profit for the uh, for the um, operations of the bank, that money will go into the trust fund so that it can be given out as grants rather than loans to very low income areas. And the idea is that all these investments would be 
for public infrastructure, for the public good, where uh, you wouldn't expect really private entities to make these kinds of investments. That's why they haven't done it over the last 60 years. Um, so we wanna build up public goods for the public benefit and make sure that the bank stays on track in rebuilding all of this infrastructure and affordable housing. Thank, thank you, Alfeca. Okay, how about let's go back to Joe Sackman who's got his hand up again. It might be an obvious uh, answer, but um, yeah. how, how is the um, how is the NIB going to be competitive with uh, like large banks? I mean, New York they're they're borrowing from Wall Street all the time. Uh, how are you going to out uh, outbid them in that sense to make sure it you know states go yeah we want to go to the NIB instead of Wall Street etc. Um, so it, you know it's to so get business in that sense. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one of the ways that we do this is we, we from the get-go, want to have a focus on providing the very low, lowest cost financing to public entities for their infrastructure projects that is possible. So we suggest around the treasury bond rate as the, ter- the interest rates that would be charged on loans. We've actually done a little bit of a cash flow to make sure that we can still meet all of our operating expenses even charging that, that those low interest loans, which would be about half a percent below municipal bond rates, for example. Uh, and don't forget, we would have government guarantees. Uh, so this is a different, a, a, a different um, uh, uh, a profitability mix than, say, a large um, Wall Street bank would be looking at. This is a public bank, but we still think we can do it within the, those parameters. If you'd like to see um, how our um, how the NIB would make and create money and still be self-sustaining, uh, we have a, a paper on our webpage um, that you can look up called "How Banks Make and How the NIB Makes and Creates Money." Thank you, Alfeca. So I would like to give a shout out to um, someone from my home state, Representative Harriet Drummond is on the line. And I'm sure Harriet is familiar with the homeless problem that we have in Anchorage uh, and in other areas of Alaska. We have extremely expensive housing costs in some of our rural areas. Housing is uh, very, very expensive. We have a lot of communities that are not on the road system. And so if you think it's expensive to get construction materials to you know, the the uh, vacant lot down the block, think about having to put construction materials for a house on a barge and ship it out to, um, you know, around the coast of Alaska, you know, making your way through icebergs and such to uh, land on a beach and get all those construction materials out there and, and hope that you haven't forgotten any uh, important parts because there's not a, a Lowe's or a Home Depot right down the street. So, we have some very significant housing issues here in Alaska, but Representative Drummond, uh, do you have any thoughts on how a national infrastructure bank might be able to help us provide more affordable housing here in Alaska? Um, can you hear me? Yes. I, I, this has been really fascinating and I'm glad I tuned in today. Um, I just attended a, a community and regional affairs committee meeting this morning in which we heard from uh, Rural Cap, which you might uh, be familiar with, Julie. Um, mm-hmm. They're a nonprofit that uh, provides a lot of services all around Alaska, including housing, uh, childcare, uh, all, uh, weatherization of, uh, of uh, homes and uh, buildings, um, all kinds of stuff like that. I'm not quite sure how the National Infrastructure Bank could help us, but uh, I'll tell you that we have really unique uh, um Uh, issues in Alaska. Number one, the distance, the isolation, the lack of transportation. Um, uh, We have uh, over 200 uh, communities. I want to say about 150 of them at least can only be reached uh, by water or air or, you know, snow machine in the wintertime when things are frozen or maybe dog sleds. But um, there are serious issues in housing in these remote communities. Um, I was, um, I worked for architects and engineers when I first came to uh, uh, Alaska in the 70s, and they built a lot of modular housing that was um, barged out to, uh, to, the, to many of these communities. Not a lot of it was built on site. Um, most of those houses that were built in the 70s are still around. And, you know, at 40, 40 years uh, later, um, they certainly need work. 
Um, families are large in, uh, in rural Alaska. There are many, many people living. Um, it was interesting to hear Mr. Sackman's um, observations about fewer people in the houses in, um, in Washington. It's the reverse problem here. Uh, in the cities, in Anchorage and uh, many other communities, we have large families of um, uh, Pacific Islanders, um, Southeast Asians that have you know, there can be a dozen people living in a two bedroom apartment. Um, and, um, and that's hard, you know, um, and it, and it's it not, it, it also wears the buildings out. Um, and it makes for really difficult situations when people are sick and, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, we've got some issues. The other thing that's happening is a lot of people for, uh, from rural Alaska from village Alaska or bush Alaska, as we call it, are moving into more urban communities. They are leaving the villages and uh, that creates difficulties with um, continuing to provide services with the schools and, um, and that sort of thing. Um, we have the reverse problem when we send teachers out to these remote communities. Many times the teachers are hired from states outside and uh, their first exposure to rural Alaska is getting off a small plane in the middle of nowhere and um, potentially finding that the teacher housing is extremely substandard and may include using a honey bucket. There is no running water in a lot of these communities. We have about 30 communities that have no running water or sanitary sewer um, situations. We also have a number of communities that are being impacted by climate change and are needing to be moved, literally moved. Um, what is it? New Talk, I think, is moving to Murtarvik, which is about nine miles away. They've got about um, a third to a half of the village moved already. They've got a new school built in the new community. They've had to build a road um, and all of that. But, you know, we've got a bunch of villages that are being impacted big time. And um, how, do you, how do you deal with that? You know, it's um, we've got really unusual situations in Alaska that no place else um, in the country um, experiences, um, as well as extremely high costs because of these uh, distant locations. Um, I did I did ask um, the director of Rural Cap um, if there was any way to to build, for example, um, uh, modular housing parts, you know, build a, a house in a, in a kit, you know, completely fabricated walls with insulation and wiring and plumbing that gets shipped out flat packed, you know, a la Ikea, but, um, but uh, house sized and, and gets assembled on site. Um, we have to, we have to make sure that the local folks have a, um, have a part in it to have ownership um, and to provide them work to, um, to assemble, um, to assemble these houses because shipping, uh, shipping building materials out there is enormously expensive and trying to assemble them on site. Um, and as, uh, as Julie said, there isn't a, um, there's not a Home Depot down the street. And I'm going to tell you a real brief story of my experience in Mountain Village a few years ago. My husband um, uh, is a rural economic development specialist, and he took me to Mountain Village, which is on the on the Yukon River. It was February. It was frigid. And I understand why it's called Mountain Village. One slip and you'd go sliding down to the river. It's a steep little village with about, I want to say about 900 people. And we stayed in what was called the... Um, uh, I think it was the city council's um, housing structure, which I'm pretty sure was something like an ATCO trailer, which there are hundreds of in Alaska that are left over from construction projects. Um, and it was perfectly serviceable housing, you know, clean, dry, warm, which was really important. But the front door had a thick steel door with, um, didn't have a doorknob. There was something like a leather glove that was tied together with rope going through the hole where the doorknob used to be and the door fit tightly enough that you could pull it open using this leather glove and then pull it shut behind you and it fit firmly in the door so it didn't open again. But it, it, it immediately occurred to me, boy, if you have a hardware problem in Mountain Village, Alaska, you can't just go down to the village to the hardware store and buy a replacement doorknob especially an industrial weight doorknob like a, a structure like that would have. So the, the, the issues are real and, and, uh, and they continue. And um, um, I'm, I'm 
I, I really like what I'm hearing here, and I would love to figure out how the bank can help us. Thank you, Representative Drummond. Appreciate the, you sharing those insights. Um, so I believe that Representative Hudson from Ohio um, is now available. Representative Hudson, are you? Off? I'm here. I'm here. Oh, okay. Representative Hudson. I'm sorry. That's okay. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing a couple of things. I just jumped on the call. But as I said in, the, in my chat, that in my district in Ohio, which is Northwest Ohio, we're facing uh, issues as it relates to affordability, older housing stock, um, and trying to, um, you know, remove some of the issues of older housing, such as lead, you know, pipes and paint and things like that as a challenge. And so we're looking at um, hopefully uh, finding ways in which to address that and deal with it in, a, in an ongoing manner so that we're not faced with, you know, having to revisit this, you know, in, in the next five or six or 10 years. So just real short, um, um, just topic, you know, just to give you the issues that we're facing and looking at. And there are some things going on at the state house um, that we're trying to, to fashion using the ARPA dollars and other things to um, address those issues. Thank you. I'd like to take this opportunity. We have a slide um, that shows a recent op-ed that was published in the Columbus, Ohio Underground. Can we uh, put that slide up? So this is a, an op-ed that was published, and I would like to extend the offer to everybody on the call that if you would like to try to get an op-ed uh, published in your local newspaper to contact our group. We'll put up the contact information for the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition. Please uh, give us a shout, uh, email, call us, and we'd love to help you um, craft your own op-ed, hopefully for publication in your local newspapers. Uh, we've also paid for some advertising in newspapers around the country, including in uh, uh, Delaware and um, for Senator Ennis and, you know, hopefully uh, the current occupant of the White House um, we also saw those ads that we um, were able to get up in Delaware. Um, so, um, so at any rate, um, let's see, we showed the slide and I'd really like to encourage all of you um, to call your congressperson. I know we had um, um, was it Mr. Uh, Meadows earlier in the call who uh, uh, said that he thought that Senator Gillibrand from New York might be a good person uh, to try to get on board? Well, we'd like to get uh, Congress people from every state um, to help us out and join this movement to create a national infrastructure bank. So um, here's the number to call your member of Congress. Uh, please ask them to co-sponsor HR 3339. If you can get a phone call set up with your member of Congress, we're happy to do a Zoom call um, for your local representatives, your state representatives, or of course your member of Congress. Um, so with that, we're gonna bring our meeting to a close here shortly. Um, uh, Joe Sackman, did you have your hand up or? Yeah, I just, uh, it was Representative Drummond had brought something to my mind. Um, uh, reservations, indigenous people. Uh, I mean, I live on Long Island, probably one of the most expensive places to live in the nation. And, you know, we do have some stark contrasts uh, and Home Depots are right down the road, but uh, reservations tend to not have the uh, resources uh, that a lot of us have around here. Um, and so what would be, could lending happen to, to a reservation? Because uh, I know that they are a sovereign nation in and of itself, but we have our trees with them. So what, uh, you know, what, what can be done for them? Yes, uh, the legislation already requires that we get these projects out into every single geographic distribution. Uh, rural, urban, rural, whatever. Uh, but we are uh, we are collecting for Congressman Danny Davis some improvements to the bill, and one of those will be to have an explicit mention of putting tribal and indigenous people on the radar. And we already have opened up dialogues with the Navajo Nation and some of the others uh, to see if we can even get some of the infrastructure bill money into those areas ahead of this NIB coming online. Uh, to provide more uh, direct financing for those areas. 
Thank you, Alfeca. And with that, I'd like to bring our, um, our forum, our town hall here this evening to a close. Thanks again, everyone for attending. Really appreciate all of your, your questions and your comments. For more information, please go to our website uh, or give us a call or email us. We're happy to uh, chat with you about the issues and the opportunities in your area and how a national infrastructure bank might help address some of those issues. So please join us. Uh, we appreciate everyone's help. So with that, we'll uh, call it an evening. Thank you, everyone.